All right, let's get things started. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Megan Arnig with Sacramento Running Association. And welcome to our third session of CIM University, where we will be discussing how to manage the aches and pains of marathon training. And we're so glad you can join us this evening. Um, I would like to introduce our guest, Dan McLean. Dan is a highly skilled uh, sports physical therapist with over 10 years of experience and the founder of Mac Performance Physical Therapy. Uh, Dan has prepared a presentation for tonight's session. And as a reminder, we will be doing a live Q&A. So if you have any questions, just drop them in the chat and we will answer them once the presentation is over. And without further ado, Dan, you may take it away. Oh, thank you, Megan. I appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Looks like we have a, a pretty good amount of people who are on the call and will continue to be cycling in here. So uh, like Megan said, we are going to um, we're going to have a PowerPoint presentation tonight. And let me share my screen and pull this up. Cool. Can everyone see that? Megan, you got that? Can we see that? Yep, we're good. Oh, perfect. Yeah. So um, today and tonight is really all about you guys, right? Um, a lot of you guys have de dedicated a lot of time to your training, time to getting ready for the marathon or any other race that you may have coming up. Um, so really take all the information in um, would be my, my biggest recommendation. If you guys see something on the slides or if something really interests you, what we're talking about, go ahead and jot it down, like Megan said, or throw it into the chat. We will be going through a Q&A at the end. If there's something about a specific slide, I've told Megan to kind of throw her hand up. She can stop me during the presentation and we can tackle that as we go. Otherwise, we'll kind of get through this thing here and, um, and get you guys on your way, okay? So let's move here. So a little bit about me, um, if you guys have never met me before, um, I was a former collegiate athlete. I actually played basketball in college at San Francisco State and came up to Sacramento after that to get my master's degree in physical therapy at Sac State, right? With Megan, stingers up, right? So um, up. I did a, stingers up. I did a long uh, term training at Athletes Performance in Florida. So if anyone has ever heard of Athletes Performance, it's now called Exos. They're huge training facilities across the United States. A lot of strength and conditioning going on, performance training. They have physical therapists, nutritionists, massage therapists, doctors, uh, skills coaches, everyone kind of working together as a team. That's really my main philosophy on how I treat people and um, kind of work together as a healthcare team to make sure everyone gets back and able to do the, the things that they want to do. Um, I came back to Sacramento after that and worked for results, physical therapy. I don't know if anyone's heard of results, a couple of different locations around Sacramento. And I was a co-owner in the company for over 10 years. And more recently within the last couple of months, I've moved and started my own practice called Mac performance, physical therapy. A lot of these different um, things that you see at the bottom here, certifications are really just to help bridge the gap between physical therapy, performance training, and overall function and performance. We're going to talk about some of these things tonight as we're going to get into some different exercises that may benefit you guys and prepare you for the, the rigors of marathon training and try to keep you as healthy as possible going into this. And we'll talk about why that's important as well. So this is uh, our clinic here, and these are different affiliations that we have. Um, Sacramento State, I've worked with Sac State Athletics over the last seven to eight years. Uh, Vista Del Lago High School up here in Folsom. We have a contract with them to do venue coverage and work in their training rooms. Um, a, a really good relationship with a bunch of different fire departments across Sacramento. And then the SRA, been doing, I was just talking with Megan, I think this is probably my my fifth or sixth at least um, CIM University doing this talk to you guys. Um, so if you guys have heard this talk before, hopefully you'll still be able to take something from it. Um, and then Fleet Feet, I'll get into a little bit of the history uh, that I have with Fleet Feet and then Flahaven Ultra Coaching. We do a strength conditioning program with them as well as all their physical therapy needs too. So a little bit of background on the clinic and, you know, being out at Sac State, got to see a lot of the track and field athletes um, while working out there, um, I've done a lot of different strength and conditioning classes. And this was 
uh, sorry, elite team uh, several years ago when we used to do a, a strength and conditioning class for them. Um, and also at Fleet Feet, uh, way back in the day, I think, started going out to Fleet Feet on J Street about eight or nine years ago. Um, and we actually had a treadmill in the back of the store. We were doing injury screens. We we're actually doing a running video uh, biomechanical analysis, which we'll talk about a lot throughout this, throughout this PowerPoint as well. Um, so we did that for a few years. We're out at races all the time, trying to do some coverage for you guys and make sure you guys are well supported. We have a pretty cool um, partnership with the SRA and are able to go to the expo for CIM every year. So if you guys are at the expo, definitely stop by and say hi. Uh, we do a lot of like runners preparation stuff, uh, runners regeneration stuff right before the marathon for um, locals and people who are out of the out of the area. So today and tonight, what we're really going to try to tackle are the most common types of lower extremity injuries in the runner. And the re reason why that's important, we'll get into that risk factors for these injuries, a lot of different injury prevention techniques. So how does strength and conditioning come into the fold? How does how you recover after your training come into the fold, uh, different stretches that you need to do, foam rolling, all that stuff. So really try to tackle all those things. And again, if you guys have questions, go ahead and, and throw those in the chat. The importance of screening. So how do we know that we're at a higher risk for injury? How do we know that we're at an optimal performance level? We have some different screening options there. And then runner-specific performance training, some different strength and exercises that hopefully you guys can take from this. And like I said, to some different recovery techniques. So it's going to be a lot packed in here, um, but I think I think we'll be able to get through everything. So really, all we're here to do is give you guys as much information, support you guys as much as possible, leading up to the to the marathon and throughout your training. There's so much on Google. I just went through and kind of took all this stuff. When you put in runner's injury or running issues, look at all the stuff that pops up and, you know, is foam rolling good? What about biofreeze? Um, do my feet over pronate? Do I under pronate? Do I have a stiff foot? I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there. So really trying to get through all that noise that you see out there um, on the internet or just talking with people and really give you guys the facts. Um, so you know which areas to really focus in and what's the big deal. Um, you guys are probably well aware that there's been a huge increase in recreational running over the last several years. Why? Because it's very easy to do. We have great groups like Fleet Feed, SRA, a lot of these running groups um, that you guys are a part of. And it's really very social, right? So you get together with your friends, you guys have a common goal, camaraderie, it really helps, um, helps with everything. The problem is the injury risk is very high for recreational running, okay? Anywhere between 20 to 80% of um, recreational runners can become injured at any given time. There's chronic injury. So, you know, maybe you're running for several weeks, several months, several years, and all of a sudden you start to get these aches and pains. And then there's acute injury. You're running and you um, step off the curb and roll your ankle, right? Or you twist your knee or you fall down and, and bump your hip. Those are more acute injuries. The big, and the reason why we're talking about injuries is because injury leads to inactivity, right? Injury leads to not being able to participate with your running group, and um, it leads to decreased fitness level, mental issues, isolation, depression, and there's so much money that gets spent every year in the healthcare system on all these issues. So I know I'm, I'm kind of, hopefully I'm, I'm getting hammering that point to you guys that um, running performance is important, but if you're unable to run due to injury, like 80% of people may, you know, come up with injury in their, in their running life that's really gonna affect your ability to participate. And that's why we're gonna go through these things and some different things to consider while you guys are training. So, um, you know, we usually do this talk in person and we have a big group and I ask questions and people are raising their hands and answering. Um, we have to do this a little bit silently here, but look at this slide. How many of the people on this call are first time marathon runners? And you guys can raise your hands or, you know, just think, okay, yeah, I am a first time marathon runner. Well, if you are a first time marathon runner, you're a novice and your injury risk again is very, very high, right? So a lot of these things that we're gonna talk about is how do you know if you're injured versus just having the normal sorenesses and aches and pains that come with training and doing a lot of running, doing a lot of physical activity. I think this is a very cool slide here. Um, this one on the left where you see the stoplight really an overall goal and overall methodology for soreness versus pain that you guys want to consider is your pain levels, 
right? And everyone has a different um, pain tolerance. But if you're running and you're at like a zero to three soreness level, you're typically going to be okay there because that, that amount of soreness is, uh, you're going to be able to recover from that and you're not going to have any issues. Once you start to get above a four, five, six out of 10, now we're starting to have a little bit more potential tissue damage, which is going to equate to that pain level that you're experiencing. Another thing to consider, if you guys go on a run, you have some soreness during the run, maybe you have some soreness later on that night, but you wake up the next morning and you don't have any soreness, that's a good thing. That's acceptable. Okay. It doesn't mean you need to call your doctor. You don't need to get an MRI, x-ray, anything like that. <clears throat> that soreness that you're experiencing has diminished within 24 hours. That's kind of like a normal training type of soreness to have. Now, if you're sore for 48 hours, even longer than that, then we need to start thinking about what you did that previous day. Maybe that long run that you have a little bit too much for you and you take a couple more days to recover before before stressing your body again now over here on the right there's usually four different levels of pain four different levels of injury so and a lot of you guys you know just think about kind of these different levels and if you're at these levels right now or if you've ever been in these different levels while you're training but usually the first level is pain after activity so let's say you go for a 10 mile run you feel great, but all of a sudden that night, ooh, now my, my Achilles is a little sore tonight, okay? That's level one. Level two is pain during the activity, but it doesn't really restrict your performance. So that same 10 mile run, maybe you start to have pain around mile five and then it sticks with you the rest of the run, but you, you can still hit your time, you can still hit your pace, you're still hitting your overall mileage, right? Now level three is pain during the activity that restricts your performance. So that same 10 mile run, ooh, I start to get pain at five miles. It progressively gets worse. I have to stop at mile eight because I just can't run anymore. That pain is too high and I can't tolerate that, right? Or you have to slow down, you have to stop, you have to stretch out. So that's usually, uh, that's usually level three in pain. And unfortunately for me as a, as a physical therapist, I start to see people a little bit too late. I start to see people around level three, level four. Level four is chronic unremitting pain at rest. So this is where you go for that run. You're having pain while you run. You're having pain after a run. You have to stop. Now you're having pain that night. You have pain the next morning. Pain, pain, pain constantly, right? At this point, the injury is pretty severe, and that's where we have to stop running. But if we can see people during maybe level one to level two for sure, level two to three, that's where we can give you guys some pointers. We can work on some things, and usually you'll be able to continue your training. Right. So just some something to consider as you guys continue to go. <clears throat> Location of injury here. So this was a study that they did back in early 2000, and they had about 2000 different runners who were doing some marathon training. They took all the people that injuries and they charted it. Right. So the knee, the largest body region, obviously, we're going to have pain. Right. Followed by the foot and ankle, lower leg, which can be, you know, somewhere around the shin area hip, pelvis, Achilles, upper leg, and lower back, okay? So again, just something to consider as you guys are running and starting to feel different things. And why is injury important? Uh, let me see if this is gonna play. So you see here, not only if you have an injury or you're overexhausted, your performance is gonna be affected, right? Not only are you gonna affect your performance, but look at, look at her buddies there. Her buddies are sitting there picking her up. So now you're affecting your team's performance. All, all those people who you're running with, you're also going to affect them. Now they got to drag you across the finish line. Nobody wants that, right? So let's be proactive with a lot of this stuff. That was pretty cool. Anyone, anyone seen this, this clip before? They kind of drug her across the finish line and is, is uh, really cool. But you don't want to be that person, right? So let's not be that person. All right, let's go to the next slide here. So uh, different different diagnoses that we're going to see as far as, as injury in our, our marathon runners. Anyone have patellofemoral pain before? <clears throat> know what patellofemoral pain is? So the, your kneecap is your patella. So really this says any pain around that area. Um, that's the highest diagnosis as far as um, percent of injury that we're going to see in the marathon trainer, marathon runner. IT band syndrome. Anybody ever have IT band syndrome? If you touch the outside part of your knee, you feel that little band that flicks back and forth. That's your IT band. It goes from your hip and goes all the way down the outside part of your thigh, attaches to the outside part of your knee. This can be super painful. 
Um, this is one of those that it starts to become painful and it gets worse and worse and worse as you run until eventually you have to stop. Plantar fasciitis. Um, I know at least one person on this call has had some really bad plantar fasciitis, uh, but this is one of those really bad diagnoses too, because every step that you take, even walking, you really stress the bottom of your foot. So shin splints, shin splints are uh, relating to your tibia, which is your lower leg bone there. Usually there's pain on the inside part of your shin. Uh, it starts out with just having some soreness there in the tissues. And then that can progress to a stress fracture later on where there's actually injury to the bone there. Patellar tendinopathy is the patellar tendon. So it's that tendon right below your kneecap. Uh, a lot of times that can get really irritated as you run and run and run each step and step and step because your quad and tendon get used every single step. And then Achilles tendinopathy. Achilles is that, that band in the backside of your ankle that runs up uh, the back of your ankle there. And your calf, quad, and hip flexor are the three main muscle groups that get worked a ton when you run. So your patella can get sore, your Achilles can get sore. Um, a lot of these have to have to do with those three muscle groups. Risk factors. Okay, so how do we know we're at an increased risk factor for these injuries? I don't think this, yeah, this video is not going to play, but this is a video of her doing a single leg squat. Um, so previous injury, that's the number one risk factor for injury. So if you've had um, Achilles, Achilles issues in the past five, six years ago, you're automatically at an increased risk to have some type of injury. It doesn't have to be an Achilles injury. It could be your opposite side because you're compensating and trying to get off that Achilles. So it could be your knee on your opposite side, for example. Poor single leg stance control. <clears throat> Who on this call has a hard time just standing on one foot balancing? If you do, then you're going to be at an increased risk for injury. Every time you run, we're jumping from one foot to the other to the other. So if you have poor static balance, you're gonna have poor dynamic balance when you're running. If you do a single leg squat and your knee kind of caves in, your knee rotates in, your foot collapses, that's also putting you at an increased risk for injury. Running is just a series of jumps into a single leg squat position. And we'll get more into that when we talk about the strength training. Novice runners, so anyone on this call who this is their first time training for a marathon, you're automatically at an increased risk for injury. You haven't built up a strong base so you have to be also very careful with what you're feeling, how you're feeling, and how hard you're training. Increased intensity. <clears throat> so men who run over 40 miles a week and women who run over 30 miles a week, and that doesn't seem like a lot, but when we do studies and we have people write down how many miles per week are you running, people who are running more miles get hurt more often. Training for an event like a marathon, right? There's a lot of pressure you know you want to you want to do well on your race so you're going to go out there and you're going to push yourself so just training for an event puts you at increased risk men who are under 34 years old i thought this was an interesting one but what they explain in the research um, studies is that typically men who are a little bit younger tend to want to push a lot harder right oh that that doesn't hurt or, or I'm, I'm going to be okay so they tend to push through things until they become really really problematic Women who have a BMI under 21, and BMI is just a body mass index. So women who are very petite, who do not have a lot of muscle mass, um, they tend to be at risk for stress fractures in their shins, okay? So just some different things to consider. We're talking about all this stuff. If you find yourself having one or two of these, then you know just have your, have your radar up a little bit more, okay? And, and this is also very important, athletes who have less than two days of rest per week have a 520% heightened risk for injury. 520%, that's a lot. So just by having less than two rest days per week, you're going to be at a much larger increased risk for injury, okay? And the reason for that is the body needs to recover. You stress the body, you stress your tissues. They need to be able to regenerate before you go out and stress them again. So that's that chronic injury that we talked about in earlier slides. All right, so what do we do? We talked about some injuries. We talked about how, you know, everyone's getting injured at some point and some different things to look out for. I think, um, you know, trying to prevent these injuries is really important and it's really about you guys and how your body's feeling. But we need to be smart. We need to warm up properly. 
you guys need to have some type of strength and stretching routine, which hopefully you'll get out of tonight. Screening yourself for these injuries and then some different runner recovery options. So what does be smart mean? Take it slow and steady. You don't want to go from not running for months or years to, you know, running 10 miles per training session. Okay. And I know that the training program that you guys are on is very slow and setting. Just stick to that. Don't try to do too much too fast. Stay hydrated. If your body weight decreases by as few as 2%, you can all automatically start to decrease your performance. Okay. You start to decrease your body weight. Your heart has to pump a lot faster to get blood flowing all throughout your extremities so that you can continue to run. Your exertion level starts to increase and you get fatigued a lot faster. Injuries can happen when you're fatigued. Don't go to exhaustion. So if you're at the end of your training run every single time and you're just exhausted, you want to fall down. Well, there's something to be said about that. And if you work your body that hard for months and months and months, every single training run, you're going to break, right? Maybe you need to look at your nutrition, look at your hydration, look at how you're recovering, look at how many rest days you have. Don't go to exhaustion every single time. And this is very important too: proper shoe wear. So this is where you partner up with Fleet Feet. You guys get in, get the proper shoe wear when you're running. If something doesn't feel right in your foot, in your shoe, get back in there. They're, they do a really good job of the fitting process. So make sure your, your feet are feeling really good. If your feet don't feel good, you're going to compensate a certain way. This is a great routine to get comfortable with. How many people just walk outside of their door in the morning, 5 a.m., and they start running? Wake up out of bed, roll out of bed, throw your shoes on, stumble down the stairs, go outside, shut your door and just go run. If you're doing that, that's not good, right? I know time commitment is huge, but take a couple minutes, do your dynamic warm up stretches. And if you haven't had a coach or anyone take you through dynamic warm up stretches, this is going to be a good resource for you. And hopefully we can get this uh, presentation over to you guys and you guys can save this slide here. So these are different movements that you want to do before you run. And before you run, quick, fast stretches. You don't want to sit there and stretch your hamstring for two minutes before you run because you're going to inhibit that muscle from contracting. Quick stretches on the muscle stimulate the muscle and they get you ready for running. So you can see the different movements here. You do five of these on each leg before you run. This lower row here, elbow to instep, turn and reach, that's kind of optional. That takes a little bit more time. But these two, top two rows here, if you go through those, do them really quick. You know, it should take you about a minute and a half and two minutes. So that can really help prepare your body for the run. Some people feel like, hey, I got to start running. I got to get to a mile before I'm warm and I feel good. These exercises are just going to speed up that process for you too. Foam rolling. How many people foam roll? Or how many people don't foam roll? Massage therapists are great, and I encourage people to get a massage at least one time a month, if not every other week when they're going through vigorous training, because it really does help relax your muscles. But on those days in between, you still need to be able to do something for yourself. So that's where you get the foam roller. It's self-mobilization. What you want to do when a muscle is very tight and guarded is you don't want to roll fast over that muscle. If you roll fast back and forth, you're going to stimulate that muscle and it's going to continue to stay tight. What you want to do is roll slowly up and down your glutes, for example. Find a tender spot. Hold that tender spot for about a minute. Throughout that minute, you might have a tender spot that's about a 6 out of 10 on a pain scale. You hold it at the minute, it should be down to like a 2, maybe 1 out of 10. Roll around. Find another spot. Roll on your quad. Oh, my quad feels good today. It's not really tight. I don't have tender spots. Cool. Move on. Go and find another, roll your hamstring, roll your calf. You don't need to spend 10 minutes on each body region, but spend the time on the body regions that are a little bit more sore, a little bit more tight. Okay. So again, this will be another good resource for you guys. Um, it shows you how to foam roll every segment of your lower body. Static hey, stretch. Dan, sorry yeah. to interrupt, but we do have a good question here. Um, ask about is um, is uh, massage guns a good alternative to foam rolling? So that's a great question. And we get this all the time. The vibration therapy is excellent. And vibration therapy in the research 
the one thing that it's proven to do is it's proven to decrease muscle soreness, okay? It's not gonna make you more flexible. It's not going to uh, release tight tissues. It's not gonna do anything like that, but it will help with muscle soreness. So let's say you go and you, you do like a tempo run or you have you know, more of a speed workout and you're really sore that next day, but you still have to get up and you have to go run four miles, five miles, whatever it is. Doing your massage gun over the areas that are sore is going to help decrease that muscle soreness and it'll help prepare you to make you feel good before you go and, and do that four or five mile run the next day. But it's not going to release muscles, right? We talked about the quad, hip flexor, and the calf are the three muscle groups that get worked the most. So those are typically going to be hypertonic or very tight. It's not going to release them. Your foam roller or getting a lacrosse ball or softball getting over those tender spots and actually waiting until they release, working on your breathing, that's gonna be the best way to release a muscle. But the vibration therapy with the massage guns are gonna help with muscle soreness. So kind of two different things that we're working on there. Hopefully that answers, hopefully that answers the question there. Okay, static stretching. So we talked about you don't wanna do long duration holds before you run, but definitely after you run, you're trying to regain the muscle length, right? Again, I, I keep saying it, but your calf, quad, hip flexor, three muscle groups that get worked tremendously when you're running, those are the muscle groups that you really wanna focus on stretching and regaining normal length tension of your muscles. So these are some good positions to be in and we labeled them here, the hip flexor stretch, calf stretch, the quad stretch on the table. This is probably the best setup that you can do to get an isolated stretch. If you try to stand and pull your quad back, you'll probably get an okay stretch with that, but you lose a lot of stretch to arching your back and trying to find out where your foot is and balancing. If you're lying on the table like this, that down leg sets your pelvis. So when you pull your heel towards your glute, you're not gonna be able to arch your back. You'll get a more isolated stretch. So that's a really, that's like a money stretch there. And then the glutes get really stiff and tight too. That pigeon pose is really the best way to stretch your glutes and piriformis. But you see, she's not going down on her elbows. She's not rounding her back. Keep your back nice and flat as you sit back into that stretch, okay? So about three sets, 30 to 60 seconds. The older that you are, I'm sorry, but the older that you are, you're gonna have to hold your stretches longer. So I tell everybody, whatever decade of life that you're in, Hold your, your stretches for that long. If you're in your 30s, hold it for 30 seconds. 40s, hold it for 40. 50s, 50, 60, 60. If you try to hold longer than one minute, the research says there is no increased benefit. So anywhere between 30 to 60 seconds, you're going to maximize your benefit, okay? All right, running performance. So we talked about some different stretches and rolling techniques to do. Uh, we talk about strength training and running performance and becoming a more efficient runner. Uh, we have to make sure your body's ready. So we talked about the warm-ups and all that. We have to increase our muscular endurance. The stronger our muscles are, the more it's going to be able to tolerate load, right? Your muscle endurance is, um, there's different ways that we can train muscle. You can train it for endurance and there's different exercises, sets and reps for that, which tend to do very well with people who are doing longer duration, like marathon training. Muscular power is more for the shorter duration runners, 5K or even shorter, more of the sprinters, right? You want to increase your hip flexor speed turnover or how, how fast you can bring your knee to your chest. You want to increase your glute max strength and endurance, okay? So the glute max is the big glute muscle on our, on our butt, and that really drives hip extension. The stronger that is, the more you can go forward in a horizontal plane versus jumping up and down. Up and down is going to be more your quad and calf, and we don't want those to get overworked. We have to strengthen in the two different running phases, beginning stance. So you guys see this picture here. Um, these guys are kind of in their stance phase, and that's more or less a single leg squat position. When we look at the late stance, and hopefully this will, let me see if it kicks on. Good. Late stance phase or toe off right there. Now you can see that hip extension. That's where that glute max comes in. So their right legs, they're really driving through the ground and they're pushing themselves forward. So this is really important when we talk about our strengthening exercises. We want to try to strengthen those two different phases of running just to be as specific as possible. Make sure we're getting the biggest bang for our buck. Strength training in general, we're trying to reverse the effects of running. 
again, we know that there's certain muscle groups that get worked a lot. And those are usually your strong muscle groups. If they become too strong and the other muscles are weaker, then all of a sudden you're gonna have some asymmetries and that's where injuries can occur. And you're gonna eventually plateau and not be as efficient a runner as you can be. Strength versus endurance. If you're a marathon runner, more endurance. For marathon training, strength training, you wanna do higher reps with your exercises, okay? So 15 to 20 reps of each exercise. Now this is, this is extremely important. Any strengthening exercise you're gonna do, it doesn't matter if you're doing six reps, 10 reps, 30 reps, go till you are very, very tired. If you're doing an exercise and let's say you're doing uh, band walks, for example, sideways band walks, which I know is, is very popular. If you're going and you take 15 steps and you're like, oh, I'm kind of tired. You're not gonna get the max benefit out of that exercise. You need to wear a thicker band, take more steps, go until you are exhausted, okay? And sometimes that's hard because you're training and you're already a little sore, but if you don't go to exhaustion, you might as, you're not really getting the most out of that exercise that you can. And the research is pretty strong on that. No matter what rep range you're doing, if you go to exhaustion, you're gonna maximize your strength gains, okay? We wanna strengthen hip abductors and flexors. Abductors are the leg going out to the side. So there's a muscle group on the side of your leg that really helps stabilize your pelvis when you're running. Hip extensors, we talked about that, why that's important. Hamstrings and spinal stabilizers. This is also very important when you guys are thinking about doing your, your strength training program. So, um, you know, when you guys are, even before you start your marathon training, that's where you wanna start your strength training, okay? Because as your running volume is low, you can do more strengthening exercises and you can balance those out really well. As you get into your peak of marathon training and you're running a lot more, you cannot do the same amount of strength and exercises because then you are going to have an overall volume overload. Okay. As your running volume increases, the intensity and amount of days that you're doing your strength training have to decrease. Otherwise, you're going to be exhausted, you're going to be fatigued, you're going to increase your injury risk when you think you're actually decreasing it by getting stronger. Okay. So pay attention to that as you guys are running more, less strength training, or even less intense strength training, okay? Here's some different things to consider on the side here. Uh, increase in strength occurs over a six week period. You can't just do exercises for a week or two, think you're gonna get stronger, it does take some time. You wanna build your base so that you can tolerate the vigors of running. Uh, as running increases, strength training decreases, and before any event that you guys are doing, you want to really avoid strength training a couple of weeks before that, all right? You want your body to be nice and fresh before you go into your event. That's very important as well. Okay, so strengthening exercises. What are some good exercises to do? Single leg RDL right here really works that glute muscle that we were talking about, that glute max muscle. And that's the one that's gonna help propel you moving forward versus jumping up and down. Side plank with leg lift. This is the number one exercise for your hip abductor strengthening. That stabilizes your pelvis. So we talk about injury risk and performance. That's a huge exercise for you. Band wobbles. One knee is staying static while the other knee is going in and out. So we're training one knee to be stationary. The other knee is moving in and out, okay? And then a single leg squat is extremely important too. We talk about training in the different phases of running. Again, that's that stance phase of running there. Here's some other exercises too, ball hamstring curls, feet on the ball, roll the ball in and out. So that's gonna get more of your hamstrings, your posterior chain and bridge on the ball single leg. This is a very difficult exercise. I would recommend starting with both legs down, but as it gets easier, then you can go to one leg, have that opposite hand down so you can really stabilize and work on your balance. Steamboats, again, work on that single leg balance. One of our big injury, um, injury risk is not having very good single leg balance. So. Steamboats is the bands around the ankle. You move the top leg forward 10 times, out to the side 10 times, and straight back. So that's going to be a really good exercise to work on your balance. And then ball, mountain climbers, you're stabilizing your core, driving one leg up, very similar to what you're doing with your running, but you're also working on your core stability there. So these are all excellent exercises to kind of throw in. I wouldn't do all of these, but Let's say you're doing exercises twice a week. You do half of them on that first day and then another half on that second day. All right. 
we're working through here. So screening, there's two different main types of screens that we do for all of our runners. The functional movement screen, which is a series of seven different movements. You get scored zero to three out of each movement to come up with a total score out of 21. This is really to assess our injury risk in addition to everything that we we're talking about before. We go through this movement and then you get some corrective exercises based on how you score. Now, the other big screening uh, modality that we use is the running biomechanical analysis that you guys seen, and we're gonna go through that. It's a treadmill video analysis. So the functional movement screen is how you move, flexibility, strength, and stability and balance. The biomechanical video analysis is just more sport specific for you guys and really working on your, your running form, your running motion, make sure there's no flaws in your running form. We do a slow motion video analysis on the treadmill. There's 14 markers you get placed on your body. And it's really to assess any deviations that we see in your running form because those small deviations, which we're gonna see in future slides here, can lead to big injuries over time. So there's a lot of research on the functional movement screen. It's really to determine, again, like I said, flexibility and stability issues in your body. If they've done multiple studies, if you score a 13 out of 21, that's considered normal for healthy distance runners. So when we do this screen, we want to at least get a 13, but there's a lot of research. If you score below 14, you're at a significant increased risk for injury too. So 13, you're kind of right there. We really want to be 14 or higher. The double, the, the deep squat and the leg raise test, those are the correlate to injury risk and the runner the most. So on this next slide, I'm going to show you guys the pictures of it, and then we can get up and you guys can do these, these quick screens and we can talk about that. Now, on the flip side, if you score over 15 on this screen, you're at an increased risk or you're at a significant increase in your performance over the next year. So this was a college track team. They screened them. People who scored higher saw their performance increase over the next year. So these are the different movements. And sorry, it's a little blurry here. That deep squat test is that number one. So uh, I know you guys aren't going to have a dowel or anything, but we'll try to do this movement right now and you guys can can tell me what you see. And then the other big one in the runner is this leg raise test. So there's a mark that we put kind of at your middle of your thigh right there. And if you can lift one leg higher than that point at the mid thigh of the down leg, then that means your mobility and your hamstrings and your hip flexor is great. And you really don't need to work on it. So again, these are things that we're screening for to make sure you have enough mobility to run and run efficiently. So those are the two movements. Now, we'll give you guys some time to kind of stand up. Again, that deep squat, I'll show you guys here. So if you don't have a dowel or anything, you can just hold your hands up overhead. Your feet are gonna be about shoulder width apart and you wanna to try to squat down as deep as you can. Now there's certain criteria that we're looking for for this. If you feel like your chest is just caving forward and falling forward, <clears throat> then that's not the form that we want. So you want to try to keep your trunk angle and your shin angle parallel to each other. So if your chest is dipping down forward or if your arms are really falling forward there, then that's going to be a faulty movement pattern. To see if it's ankle mobility that is your issue, you can put your shoes down, step your heels on your shoes and your toes are off of your shoes. That's going to slacken your ankles. Do that same movement again. If you feel like you're able to get deeper into your movement, you're able to keep your chest up a little bit more, then most likely you have an ankle mobility issue. And then we can show you some exercises to work on that. Okay. Again, this is typically a lot easier to do in person. We're trying to do a little bit virtually here. So if you guys want to do this, go ahead and stand up. Feet are about shoulder width apart. Bring your arms up in the air as high as you can. Kind of reach overhead. Squat down as deep as you can go. If you feel like that stick or your hands are coming out in front of you past your toes, if you feel like your chest is dipping down too much or you can't get good depth, then stand back up. Put your shoes or something on the ground where you can elevate your heels. So then you step on your shoes just with your heels and your toes are down. Do that same squat again and see if that feels a lot easier for you to do. If it feels a lot easier for you to do, you might have an ankle mobility issue. And that's where you'd work on calf stretching, soleus stretching. You'd work on a little banded stretch for your ankle. <clears throat> okay. You want to clear that squatting pattern. 
All right. Now we can do the leg raise test too. So this one is really simple, simple leg raise test. For this one, you're going to lie on your back. Okay. Typically there's a board underneath your knees, but we won't worry about that. Lie on your back with your hands by your sides. You want to keep your feet straight and you want to dorsiflex your ankles. So pull your toes up towards your shins. Keep both knees nice and straight. You're gonna lift one leg up as high as you can. Remember, keep the knees nice and straight. If you feel like that, that leg that you're raising up is moving past the midpoint of your down thigh, then you're good. You got enough mobility in your hamstring and hip flexor. You don't need to do any excessive stretching. If you feel like you're not able to reach that midpoint or you're just barely lifting your leg up and you can't even get past your knee on the down leg, well, then we have a big issue with your hamstring or hip flexor mobility, right? Once you do one leg, go ahead and switch sides. Raise that other leg up. Remember, keep both knees nice and straight. Raise it up as high as you can. If you're getting past the midpoint of your down thigh with your heel, you're good. If you're not, then you need to spend a little bit more time working your hip flexor and your hamstring mobility. Everyone have time to do that? Go ahead and put in the chat. Let's see how many people, <clears throat> when they raise their leg, feel like they were able to get past their mid thigh on that down leg. If you are able to do that, say yes. If you are not able to do that, say no. And then we'll move on to this next slide here. And again, like we talked about with the overhead squat, there's different things that we can do to increase that overhead squat. Ankle mobility, you can do just your gentle calf stretching, straight leg calf stretch, bent knee calf stretch, work on that ankle mobility. Hip mobility too can be an issue. So that's where you can do that pigeon stretch that we showed in the previous slide. Or there's a stretch where you can put a band around your hip and pull your knee towards your chest to work on that range of motion. Hip stability, if both of those are really good, like, oh, my ankle moves really well, my hip mobility, I can pull my knee all the way to my chest, there's no problems there. And that's where you can put a band around your knees and work on that squat pattern. And that's really gonna work your hips, which will help that squat pattern. For that leg raise test, again, if you're not able to get past your midpoint of your thigh, then start working a little bit more on your hamstring and hip flexor mobility, which we showed in the previous slides there, okay? So that's just, that's like a little teaser to some of the different movements that we would take you through in the, that movement screen. Um, and then some different corrective exercises that we would give you to address that. So the running biomechanical analysis, um, I don't know if anyone on the call has done one of these before, but um, this is super beneficial. And let's say, man, I do my strength training. I do my flexibility exercise. I feel really good with that. But when I start running, things just feel like they fall apart or I'm not really sure if I'm running correctly or if I have any deficits in my running form. This is that marker placement that we put on, right? And you're going to see, we're going to look at different pathologies and what they look like as far as running form. We can draw lines. We can see what your hips are doing. We can see what your ankles are doing. We can see if you're getting appropriate range of motion in all of your joints while you run. And we go through the results with you. So what anterior knee pain feels like, and remember, that's knee pain is the number one body region that starts to get irritated when we, when we run and have injuries. If you overstride, meaning your heel goes out in front of your hip, you're going to be at a large increased risk for anterior knee pain. If your knee is really stiff when you land, when you can see that, that's also a risk factor in what we see with the analysis. And that's what knee pain looks like. Why overstriding is very important is because they've done a ton of research and put force plates underneath the treadmills. A normal stride when you stride in heel contact or foot contact underneath your body looks like the chart on the right there. It's a nice, smooth, symmetrical bell curve. When you overstride and you have an aggressive heel strike, you get a little spike right there. So you see where that arrow on the left one is? You get that spike and then you get a bell curve off of that. That's with each step. So that little spike is like taking a hammer and jamming it into your heel with each step. Over time, something is going to break down. That's what knee pain looks like. So a really cool study that they did there. So anterior knee pain can also look like hip drop. Your hips should remain relatively level when you stand. If you have this, that's where we give you the side plank exercise. We start working on those hip abductors to really stabilize your pelvis. Vertical displacement. So this is jumping up and down versus moving forward. 
again, this is something that we screen for. This is a big problem because the, the more you jump up, you have to come down and hit the ground harder. And over thousands and thousands of footsteps, that adds up. Achilles issues. This is what Achilles issues look like. You can either stretch too far, like this gal on the left. That's a lot of range of motion that her ankle's gone through. So her Achilles is just getting really stretched and worked with excessive dorsiflexion. Lack of hip extension. This gal is not getting very much hip extension at all. That's almost a straight line. Four degrees of hip extension. You usually get about 20 to 30. So if you have that, then your Achilles has to work a lot harder to try to push you forward. So again, different ways that we're looking at the body and how it moves when you run. IT band syndrome. If your foot crosses midline, like you see this gal on the left, crosses midline, just pulls on that IT band, then you'll start getting pain on the outside part of your knee. Or if you overpronate, and we also put too many toes, if your foot's rotated in or out, your foot is just caving in like that overpronation, that can lead to IT band syndrome or tibial stress fractures as well. Whew, a lot of stuff. So what do we do, right? We talked about uh, a lot of different things. We talked about different areas of injury, risk factors, strength and exercise you can do, um, screening things that you can do. But what happens when you start to feel pain? Now, remember, if you are in that zero to three range, soreness wise, it goes away within 24 hours, you're good. If you're starting to have pain it's progressing through our different levels of injury. Now you're having pain during your runs. It's affecting their, your pace. It's affecting the volume. Then you definitely need to get it checked out. I don't care who you go see. If you have a chiropractor that you trust, you have a physical therapist that you trust, an orthopedic specialist, doctor, uh, anybody, any healthcare provider who you trust, go and see them when it's early and it's you know just starting to get sore. Because a lot of times we can give you guys stuff that you can continue to run. But if it comes to a certain point, it's like, okay, well, now you have to stop running. You have to stop your training and nobody wants to do that. Okay. So get it checked out early and often. There's a lot of different things that we can do. Everyone's seen Phelps. Uh, this was several years ago now, but cupping is a big, big thing that we can do to really address scar tissue, really address pain and continue to keep you running. Okay. So that's just one of the modalities that we can use. That little divot in the cup there, that's scar tissue. So that should be a nice, smooth, half-domed shape with your tissue. When it starts to look wrinkly like that, or there's a little divot, that's a big area of scar tissue and tightness that we need to work out. And a lot of times it feels a lot better after that. Grasping technique, we can do a lot of that stuff, really work on your body, make sure that you're able to continue training the Alter U treadmill. We have one of these in a facility off of Highway 50 in Bradshaw. The Alter G is really beneficial if you can't run because it hurts. You can get in the treadmill. You can continue to train at maybe 50, 60% of your body weight without the pain. So that's a way that we can keep you going. Um, there's Normatec compression boots. Nobody try to get in them like that. That's not the way you use them. But these are uh, similar to like an ice bath or just massaging your legs out. Um, a lot of people have these now. They're becoming more affordable. We talked about the massage gun. That's really good to help with your muscle soreness um, in between really rough runs. This is a runner's recovery package that we offer runners, especially training for marathons. <clears throat> so you come in, we give you the, the vibration gun, you use that on your body, we show you how to use it. We have the Normatec boots here to help flush your legs out and the game ready machine, which is an ice compressive unit. So we combine all three of those and then you get on the bike afterwards to get new blood back into your extremities. So it's a really, really great way to work on recovering in between your hard runs and as training continues to progress. So in summary, and I think we're, we're getting, oh good, we have about 10 minutes, so we should have enough time for, for questions. In summary, repetitive running can lead to injury, especially if you're a novice runner and you have those, a couple of different injury risks that we talked about. So you gotta be proactive. Really take into consideration some of the things that we talked about tonight. Develop a strength and stretching regimen. Screen for injuries before they happen. Ideally, we screen for these things before running really ramps up, but it's not too late. Address minor injuries before they become major. So just make sure you're getting checked out. If you're starting to feel things over a couple of weeks, maybe it's not horrible. It can progress. Just get it checked out so it doesn't become a bigger issue in the future. And if we do all these things, you're going to be able to run faster, stronger, longer than ever. You're going to be a lot more efficient of a runner. And then you're going to reach all your goals that you set out before this process. These are a lot of the different services that we offer for the runner, especially leading up 
to the marathon. And again, we will be at the expo. So if you guys, you know, make it to the expo and you stick around a little bit, come by, say hi, check out what we're doing. And at this point, here's some contact information for me. These are my two little kids showing their muscles here. So that's how strong you guys can be too. But we will now open it up to questions that we have in the chat, or if anyone wants to do a live question, we can do that as well. So here are all the references for what we've talked about. I will stop my screen here and we can get to some of the questions. So it looks like we have a few up at the top. Um, someone was asking about uh, compression clothing uh, for recovery. Um, would you recommend that? What'd you say, Megan? I'm sorry, cut out a little bit. Sorry, uh, another, uh, one of the questions up in the chat uh, was talking about compression clothing for recovery. Yeah, compression um, clothing is really good, especially the socks that are becoming more and more popular. Uh, you know, when we run, you develop soreness in your muscles. A lot of times that soreness is coming from micro inflammation in your muscles. So your calves, again, they get worked a lot. So if your Achilles and calves are a little tight, that tightness can be due to some inflammation. So that's where the compression socks, um, especially the high ones, can really help out. And it's not just for running. You can wear them you know, throughout your work day, after your training, if, if you're starting to feel a lot of stiffness, tightness in your um, calves and ankles, not necessarily just pain or your knees, you know, anything like that stiffness, a lot of the times around your joints is swelling and inflammation. So that's where the compression therapy can really help. And then uh, we have another one right here um, asking about using a TENS unit. Um, is that a good to use or could it be harmful? Um, TENS units are almost, uh, they're never really harmful. The TENS unit is really meant to trick your brain into not feeling pain. <laughs> so if you are having knee pain, for example, you put the TENS unit on your knee and you use it appropriately, you turn it up to where you feel pins and needles sensation in between the pads. Nothing higher than that. If you're turning it up and your muscles are squeezing and contracting, that's too high. But if you turn it up to where you're feeling pins and needles, your brain is going to be tricked into feeling pins and needles versus pain. So it's going to work while the TENS unit is on. There might be a little carryover afterwards, but usually within 30 minutes, an hour, um, that effect wears off. So it's not harmful. Um, it can help if you are in a lot of pain, though. And then uh, we actually have another one about uh, rest days. Um, so if you're doing any light uh, weights or leg plyo, um, could that count as a rest day? Uh, yes, that can. So that's, that's going to be more active recovery. So when we have that slide about less than two rest days, um, it's really resting from running and resting from that repetitive motion, right? So you can even swim, like swimming is a, a great rest day, like active recovery. Um, cycling is also a really great rest day, active recovery. Intensity wise, you wanna keep your intensity low, right? You just wanna have moderate intensity, get blood flow going. Um, and that's actually really good for recovery. It's not always good just to sit and do nothing on your rest day. Active recovery is gonna help promote blood flow to your extremities and really help that healing process. Plyometrics, I would say, is not going to be a rest day, okay? So light strengthening, maybe like body weight strengthening exercises could be okay, but if you're lifting heavy weights, that's probably not going to be considered a, a rest day. And then uh, we have another one in the chat talking about uh, when to use heat versus ice. Great question and very debatable right now. <laughs> so ice, um, ice is under a lot of scrutiny. A lot of people are coming out and saying that icing um, can actually have bad effects on your body but um, the main reason you would ice something is because of pain right ice's main um, usage is going to be for pain management so if something is really swollen and that swelling is causing you pain because of the pressure it's put on the nerves then icing is going to be good you don't just want to ice just because though right so heat can be a good thing too especially if you're having a lot of muscle soreness Generally, you want to heat muscles and you want to ice joints, 
okay? If you ice over the joints, then you're gonna help decrease that irritation around the joints. Try not to ice muscles unless you really strain it hard or tear something, then you, you, know, you can use ice as a modality, but heat's gonna be better for tendons and muscles, ice is gonna be better for knees. Knees, joints, ankles, that type of stuff. Now, uh, forgive me if I say this wrong, but I know this is kind of a popular thing in a, a someone actually commented on it, uh, cryotherapy chamber, yeah. if I yeah. said that right, a full yeah, body, um, yeah. yeah. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> so uh, if, you know, as your training increases and your body is really fatigued, really sore, really stiff, you're kind of in that constant stiffness, fatigue state, that's where uh, something like the cryo chamber can help. And for those who aren't familiar, it's a big chamber. You walk in it. It's extremely cold. They have you put gloves on your, your hands and your feet um, just to protect your outer extremities. Uh, but the main purpose of that is to uh, put you in kind of like a, a frozen state so that all the blood from your extremities goes into your trunk. So you get rid of like that inflammation, all that buildup of breaking down your muscle. All that blood goes into your trunk. Then you get out of the chamber and you typically get on a bike or something and heat your body back up. Now your trunk distributes new blood to your extremities, which again, helps with healing and helps with recovery. Very similar to what an ice bath would do um, or you know, dunking your legs into like a cold tub. It has a very similar effect to that. Um, so I would say if you're really exhausted, your body's really just fatigued, chronically tired, sore, that would be a good thing to do. But again, just like icing, it's not something that you want to just continue to do if you don't need to do it. And then um, we have one last comment here that I see um, talking about uh, pain and a type of cramp during long runs. And um, over their last weekend, uh, they said that they massaged it out. And after the run, the discomfort hasn't really gone away. Um, would you recommend not running uh, like a long run a week later? I know that uh, some situations can be very specific, but um, should you take away a complete long run over the weekend or would that be something to do a lighter type of running or a cross training? Yeah, this, this is a great question. And I'm sure, you know, one person put that in the chat, but I'm sure a lot of people have experienced this. And if you go back you know, to our slide and think about our four different levels of injury, first is I only have soreness after the run and then it kind of goes away, right? Second is I have pain during my run and it kind of just stays with me during the run, doesn't change my, you know, how long I can run. Third is I have pain during the run and I can't really make it through or I can't hit my time or I can't hit my, my distance. Once you start to get in there and you start to have soreness for more than 24 hours, that's where you need to really kind of consider what you're going to do next, right? Normal soreness should go away within 24 hours. If something is going 48 hours, 36 hours, and then you go try to run on it again, it's probably going to make it more sore again. So I'd hate to say, because every situation is different and um, I hate to say, you know, don't run at all or, you know, decrease your mileage, but you really just have to listen to your body. If you are still sore, just walking around or hopping on one leg, you kind of know that your next run is probably going to irritate it a little bit more and it's going to take longer to get back to your normal training. So that's where, you know, cross training may come into play. That's where cycling, swimming, elliptical, something non-impact. Um, you can still get your fitness going while you're waiting on your, your tissue to heal. Now, if this is something that continues to go on and you're sore for like a week, two weeks, that's where you need to go and see somebody, get it checked out and get it screened. All right, um, I think we've hit all of our questions. So um, Dan, thank you so much for coming out and speaking to us. I know that I've learned a lot and I know everyone else definitely has here too. Um, and thank you everyone for showing up to this call today. Uh, we're going to be back on November 17th, uh, getting ready for race day. So um, it'll be your last one before the race. So definitely hop on that call. We would love to see you there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. See you later. Thanks.